I do. Let's see this here. Oh, Lord. Dear Lord, thank you today for the opportunity to uh, talk about you and your word, um, to have my daddy uh, speak. And I just pray, Lord, that you will come in here and that you will bless this time and that you will fill my dad with the Holy Spirit and that you will anoint him and you will anoint his word and that every single thing that comes from this is for your glory and that you have determined. We love you with all our heart. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say good morning and I'm glad you're here. It's been about, this is the second Sunday since uh, we've been shut down at church and not able to have Sunday school. And we thought this would be a good idea to do it this way. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, there are some that don't assemble, but exhorting, exhorting one another, we're encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And the day approaching is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to meet. And it, it's a stop. The government stopped the assembly from meeting. And we need to meet because the Bible tells us, Paul says that, the, that we, the Christians, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That's Romans 15 verse 4. The hope that we have as believers is not the hope like I hope tomorrow I can go to Walmart and get toilet paper. That's not our hope. Our hope rests in Jesus Christ and the faithfulness of His Word that He will do what He said. I listened to a pastor last week on Friday that I think a lot of, and he said if we look back at this event that we will compare it to Pearl Harbor and 9-11. I don't know about that because I think both of those led to major wars. And I do know, though, that we need hope. And Bible study will bless us, encourage us, comfort us, and we will learn. And there's something else that the Bible study will do that most of us don't think about. And that is, it reminds me of when I was at the Methodist Hospital in Houston back in 1975. Uh, a doctor, a young doctor told me, he said, if you feel low in the afternoon, you take a shower and you'll feel better. And that's just really common sense. Jesus said something like that in John 3.10 where he said, he that is washed need not wash save to wash his feet. Now I want you to get this. You're washed except your feet. But he said you're clean every whit, everywhere you're clean. And we are clean, but not all. What we need sometimes is a good feet washing. We walk down the roads of this life in this old world, and our feet get better, get dirty. And if we wash, we feel better. Uh, Ephesians, if you'll turn to Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5.26 is what I'm going to read in a minute. But Ephesians 5... Verse 23 says Christ is the head of the church, New Testament church. Now, when you listen to me, my Sunday school class that are listening, they know how I teach. But you have to keep your finger in the verse that I'm talking about because verse 23 of Ephesians 5 says Christ is the head of the church. And I want to say just a word about the word church because it's a very confusing uh, word. In the New Testament, which is in Greek, the church is ecclesia. It has two meanings. It is a place of worship, like I teach a Sunday school class, west of Tyler on FM 724, in a building that we call a church. The second meaning is a local assembly of believers. You might say believers of what? Over in Acts 7.38, where Stephen was reading the high priest in the Sanhedrin, the riot act, he mentioned Moses in the church in the wilderness. Well, the church in the wilderness was not a New Testament church. The church in the wilderness was a called out assembly of Israel. It was not a called out assembly 
of the believers in Jesus Christ. Now, back to Ephesians 5.23, and I hope you have that verse. Christ is the head of the church. Not a man, not anything. Christ is the head of the church. In verse 25, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, Ephesians 5.26, this is amazing to me if you read it and read it in detail. He loved the church. He's the head of the church. He died for the church. He says that he might sanctify it. Don't be scared of that word. That simply means he set you apart for a reason. That he might sanctify it and cleanse it, and that's the church, which is made up of individual believers, with the washing of water by the word. So we are cleansed when we read the scripture. That's what I believe. Now today, I hope to get into Ruth. We're going to study the book of Ruth. In our Sunday school class, we spent several weeks studying 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, which is a caught up of the church where Jesus takes his bride off of this earth into heaven. The next event would be the marriage of the Lamb. Last time we met, a week before last, or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever, we were talking about the Jewish wedding and how it compared to the wedding of the bride of Christ and the bride, which is the church. Well, I didn't feel comfortable teaching that in this venue, but the Lord laid on my heart that if you're going to have a wedding, in most cases, you have a love story. And the book of Ruth is a love story. Now, you can either read through Ruth, which take you 10 or 15 minutes, might take me 20, or you can study Ruth, and we're going to study Ruth. Now, I'm going to ask for prayer requests. We have some. We have them on the board. And as I thought about this, I thought about unspoken prayer requests. Some people say that, that have a problem with that. I don't. Matthew 9, 4 says, and several other places in the Bible tells us that God and the Lord knows our thoughts. So you might say, if he knows our thoughts, why should we pray? Well, because 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray without ceasing. In other words, we should be in a constant uh, posture of prayer. Have you ever thought about, and I think about this quite often, why it is so difficult to pray? I'd rather lose weight than pray, and I hate dying. I have trouble praying, and sometimes I wonder if it's not because we feel like we're not worthy to approach our Heavenly Father. We're not worthy to approach our Heavenly Father. And you know this is true, we're not, and we never will be as long as we're in this old flesh and we have old Adam living within us and while we're on earth. But the thing about it is we have an advocate. And if you'll turn to Isaiah 61.10, I'm going to try to give you time to find that scripture. It's in the Old Testament. It's the first one of the major prophets. And always remember, major is only in length. Minor is a shorter prophet. But they're just as powerful and meaningful as a major. But if you look at Isaiah 61, 10, it is a marvelous verse. It says, God says through Isaiah, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Look at that word, it's capitalized, L-O-R-D. That means that is Jesus Christ, that's Jehovah, that's the creator of the universe. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. And what is the garments of salvation? He tells us next, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. His righteousness, not our righteousness. If you're, going to, if you're going in your righteousness, you're lost. You're clothed once you accept Christ with the robe of righteousness. And it says, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. <clears throat> he, it says, he, God, has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as I said, this is Jesus Christ's righteousness, not ours. Our righteousness, the Bible tells us, is as filthy rags. They're not any good at all. But once we put our trust in Christ, 
we are clothed with a robe of righteousness. Therefore, we can go to God in prayer through Jesus Christ. So therefore, in Hebrews, it says in chapter 4, verse 16, because we're clothed with this robe of righteousness, let us therefore come boldly. Now that doesn't mean disrespectful. That means with confidence. Let's come with confidence unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Listen to this. Find mercy. We all need mercy and grace to help when? In the time of need. And we need right now. We're in need. Uh, before prayer, I want to read Ephesians 5.20. And read reason I want to read this, it is a blueprint, in my opinion, for prayer. And here's what it says. It's in Ephesians, which means Paul wrote Ephesians, and Paul only writes to believers. And he says, giving thanks always for all things. You know, that's kind of hard to do. Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've got to read something else, and I'm going to have to turn to it. It's Romans 8. So let's turn Romans 8 before we pray. Uh, Romans is right after Acts, and I'll, I'll be a little slower finding it than you are. So, in Acts, we found Acts. Let's turn to Romans, and Romans 8. Remarkable scriptures, hard, hard, hard for us to understand sometimes, but we have to trust the Lord. But I want to read these for one reason. A lot of people say, I don't know how to pray. Well, just pray what's on your heart, giving thanks and pray to the Father in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. But let's read uh, verses 26 through 28 in Romans 8. It says, Likewise, the Spirit, that's God's Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses, what we need. For we know not what we should pray for, as we ought. That's my case. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that which cannot be uttered. So we're covered. You pray what's on your heart, and God will take care of the rest. Verse 27. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of the God. To me, you have the, you have the Trinity right there in that verse. You have Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Heavenly Father. And then verse 28, which we have to accept. If you believe one part of the Bible, you need to believe all of it. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, that's those that are clothed with righteousness, according to His purpose. It's always according to God's purpose, because God has a plan, and that plan is going to be carried out. And let me tell you, when we study Ruth, you'll see this verse in action. It is amazing. Now let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time that we can study that word, and we praise you for who you are, our, our Savior and our God. We pray for our nation. We pray for the leaders of this nation, Lord. I pray that they'd wake up and give you credit for what you do. I pray for the teaching, for the leaders of this country. I pray for the leaders of the church, Lord. I pray for salvation for those that are lost. I pray for those that are out there working today. I pray for those who are out of work today. I pray for those that need help. I pray for the lady in Ben Wheeler, Lord, that has the virus. We pray for her daughters. We pray for those in our Sunday school class who are at risk. And Lord, we've been asked to pray for Jacob, and we pray for him. We pray for the, the that you'll open our hearts and our minds to receive your word, and Lord, we just love you and thank you for all that you do. We ask you to forgive us where we fell. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Bible verses. Uh, next, I'm gonna, I have to say this because some out there are not members of the Sunday school class that I teach. I teach out of the King James Version. And I am not a King James Version only person. But I want to give you some scriptures, and I want to tell you why I teach out of the King James Version of the Bible. And I would say probably the Schofield is the best Bible. But I don't use it. I have one. I use a 
one from Liberty University, because I'm ultra conservative, I guess you'd say. But first, the King James Version has, has this. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. In Matthew 1, 27, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Why is this important? It's important because in Ruth, we're going to study the Kingsman Redeemer. The Kingsman Redeemer has to be able to redeem. When God lost man in the Garden of Eden, when man sinned, and they become a gap, a, a, a divide between man and God. Man was a sinner. God lost man to Satan, to the world. Man had to be redeemed. Man, God had to become flesh. He had to be able to redeem man. And the only way he could do that is for him to be the father of the baby born in Bethlehem. So it had to be a virgin. Otherwise, he would not be able, Jesus Christ would not be able to redeem us. So the word virgin needs to be in your Bible. Why? Another important part is blood. In Ephesians 1.7, it says, We, the believers, have redemption through his blood, through Jesus Christ's blood. And it says, the forgiveness of sin. I'm one of those believers. The Bible teaches that our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. But you notice, I always pray for forgiveness of my sins because I sin every day. Now, Colossians 1.14 says, We have redemption through his blood, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission. Of sin. There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So what I'm saying is, I use the King James Version. If you have one that does not have virgin in it in those scriptures, and you do not have blood, my advice would be throw it away, because it's not accurate. However, in Ruth, we're, we're studying Ruth this morning, but before we study Ruth, I want to read Genesis 3.15 and Galatians 4.4. 4. And they're, they're completely polar opposites as far as distance apart. They're about 4,000 years apart. Now, some scholars say millions of years, but let's say 4,000. Over in Genesis 3.15, this is where it all began. And as soon as man sinned, God made a remedy. And this actually, what he says here is really the start of our redemption. Genesis 3. Verse 15, I, and that's the Lord God up in verse 14, will put enmity, which it means a constant struggle. And I think everybody out there knows we're in a constant struggle. We're in one now. It's terrible. So he says, I will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman. And that's a woman from here on out. That's generation after generation. And between thy seed, which you say this, that Satan have offspring, no angels, and he's a fallen angel. He doesn't reproduce, but I tell you what, he's got plenty of help because there's Antichrist, there'll be a false prophet, and there will be an Antichrist, and then there's little Antichrist. Now, it says, uh, between the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and her seed is Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, it shall... Your, it shall, that's Jesus Christ, shall bruise thy head. You know, the only way to kill a snake is to crush its head. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He, he killed Satan as far as his, uh, his putting us in hell. He can't do it. And then he goes on to say, and, and thou shall bruise his heel. And this happened at, cross, at the cross. Let's turn to Galatians 4.4. 4. That's the beginning. And that's the beginning of what's called the scarlet thread of redemption. And that scarlet thread of redemption runs throughout this Bible, throughout God's Word. That's what this is about. The scarlet thread of redemption from Genesis 3.15 to Galatians 4.4. 4. And let's look at Galatians 4.4 4 and see what it says. Uh, but when the fullness, but when the fullness of time was come, that's about 4,000 years, as I said. And what that means is God's program is right on schedule. And when everything was in place, this is what happened. God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, born, it says made of a woman, 
is born of a woman, made under the law. In other words, Jesus came. He was a Jew. And remember, he was under the law. We're not. He was. He, he took care of the law. Sometimes read Colossians 2, verse 14, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So we see the scarlet thread of redemption since the need. God had a plan, and it goes all the way through the Bible to Galatians 4, 4, when the, with the coming of Jesus Christ, and, and he came. He was on earth three years, and he died on the cross. He was buried, and he rose again. And if you believe that in your heart, you know you're lost, and you believe that, then you're on your way to heaven. It doesn't start when you die. It starts right now. You have eternal life beginning right now. Now, I read that because I wanted you to see, and I know those in, my, that in the class that I teach have heard me say this before, the Word of God, the Bible, is a progressive revelation. And if we're going to study it, we need to ask some questions. And the questions are, first, how much time do I have? The first question is, the first question is, who wrote Ruth? You ask who wrote it, when was it written, why was, uh, to whom was it written, and, and why was it written? That's what you ask. And you, you ask those questions, and you get the answer, you're going to understand what you read. Now I said, I asked the question, who wrote Ruth? Some people say Samuel did, some people say King David did. We don't know who wrote Ruth. What we do know is Romans 3, 2, Paul wrote to the Roman believers because that unto them, the Jews, were committed the oracles of God or the word of God, then we know whoever wrote Ruth was a Jew. We know that. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That, that phrase, inspiration of God, pictures God breathing into man his word and that man will then write it down. So, you know, there's a lot. I thought about this when I was reading this. There's a lot of people that says Moses could not have written Deuteronomy because in Deuteronomy, the last part of it, Moses write about, he writes about his death. Well, that's foolishness. God knew how Moses was going to die. He knew when he was going to die. And the Holy Spirit told Moses what to write. So, who wrote, wrote, uh, who wrote Ruth? The person that wrote Ruth was our Heavenly Father in the person of His Spirit. That's who wrote Ruth. He didn't. He used a human being, but we don't know who it was. The next question is, when was it written? Let's turn to Ruth. I'm glad we're going to get to Ruth. At least you'll feel like we're going to be in the book. We will study Ruth, and we will read it through. You can read it this week. But we get the answer to the question, uh, when Ruth was written by reading Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of the judges, the judges rule, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So when was it written? It was written during the time of judges. Now, if you look at the last verse in my Bible, it's right above it, the last verse of Judges. You'll see what the situation was. And that is uh, chapter 21, verse 25. It says, in those days, the days of Judges, there was no king. It was a theocracy. God was their king. There was no king in Israel. And to get a load of this, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We have that in Washington, D.C. today, but we can't live in a society with that. And that's what Israel had. Every man did what was right, and they had chaos. What they had was, they had, they had a problem. Now, uh, they had seven apostates, apostates, uh, falling away from God. And I really believe, and I want to believe, that uh, Ruth was written during the time of a man called Ehud who was left-handed and since I'm left-handed I kind of favor him but he was uh, he was a judge and uh, Moab had had been uh, had been in they had been in servitude to Moab for about 18 years I think 
and then 40 years they were at peace. Now, some people think Ruth was written during the time of Gideon. That may be possible. But we know it was written during the time of Judges. Uh, there were seven uh, servitudes, and that is uh, Israel served, as I said, Moab 18 years. There were seven deliverances, uh, and Judges covered a period of 300 years. That's a long time. And the next question we ask, we ask who wrote Ruth, when was Ruth written, and now to whom was Ruth written? Well, it was written to the Jews, but you'll find the Bible is written to Israel a lot of times in the, in the, in the Old Testament and the in four Gospels, but, but it's written for us. So if you'll turn to 2 Timothy 3.16... I'll read, we'll read that. 2 Timothy 3.16. Remember the T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus. But we look at uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. Here's what we find. <clears throat> all Scripture, and that's all Scripture from, from Genesis to Revelation, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, some Translations, I believe, have their teaching, which I don't like that. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, why was Ruth written? It was written for us. And the Bible says it's profitable for doctrine. And doctrine is what God wants us to believe. It's profitable for reproof. And that is what God says if we're doing wrong. It's, it's profitable for correction. That's, how, that's what God says we need to do to correct the wrong. It's, it's good for instruction in righteousness, and that's God telling us how to live. So the Bible is important to a believer, and that's why we're having Sunday school in this vineyard, and we're going to have it as long as we can. But I want to tell you, Ruth is a history covering a 10-year period providing information as to certain customs and activities in the period of judges around Bethlehem, and this is important because that's where our Savior was born. Now, the last question, and it's an important question, and this is a question that's going to help you to understand the Bible. Why was Ruth written? Well, we said it was written for history, but without the book of Ruth, you could not connect the house of King David with the, with the tribe of Judah. King David... In the Davidic covenant, God made a promise to David that they would be an eternal king, and that eternal king is Jesus Christ. And he's coming out of the tribe of Judah because in Genesis 49, when Jacob blessed his 12 sons, when he got to Judah, he said, the scepter, which I can't pronounce, it's a symbol of, of kingship, shall not depart from Judah. That's prophecy. So, and, and Ruth connects this. In Revelation 5, 5, I love this verse. It says, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. And what this is talking about, people don't realize this, but the tribulation period, which is the next thing on God's agenda is the rapture of the church, the caught up of the church. Then you will have a seven-year tribulation period. That tribulation period is going to come from heaven. It's not going to come from earth. Right. We're going through tribulation now, but it's not the tribulation period. This is coming, this is man-made. What comes from heaven is Jesus Christ made. And he's the one that's going to orchestra it. But from the book of Ruth on the Old Testament interest centers on the family around the King David and the family of David, mainly. Now, most important why this book was written is this. Boaz, I want you to think about this. Boaz is Rahab's son. Remember who Rahab was? When Israel came into uh, Jericho, there was a prostitute that helped them. Her name was Rahab. And, and she was what we call saved. And I hate to use the word because some people don't understand what we're talking about when we're talking about saved. But that really means to me that I can talk to God through Jesus Christ and I have eternal life in heaven. But Boaz, Rahab's son, furnishes the only figure for the Kingsman Redeemer Kingsman Redeemer aspect of redemption in the Bible. 
Now, if, if just a word about redemption. I've never had to do this. I had to come close. But redemption basically in the Bible is this. Say I'm in a hard financial problem and I take my watch down to the pawn shop and I pawn it and I get money. Well, when I go back to get it, I have to have money to buy it back. And that's what redemption is. God is buying back mankind and Jesus Christ did. It. And lastly, the book of Ruth gives a normal Christian experience. And this is for all of us. It's Ruth deciding. Chapter 1. It's hard to understand, but John 3.16 says, For whosoever will. John 6.44 says that no one comes to Jesus Christ unless the Father draws him. Uh, John 6.14 says no one comes through the Father except through Jesus. Well, the problem is, the thing, the way I look at it is that the heart is prepared and then God draws you to him and you have to decide. And Ruth decides. There's two young women standing at the crossroads in Moab. One decided on our Heavenly Father. The other decided to go back to her gods in, in Moab. Now, so number one in chapter one, Ruth deciding. Chapter two is Ruth serving. Once you decide, you don't work to keep your salvation. You work because you have salvation. By the way, if you read in the Psalms, David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The salvation is God's. Chapter 3 is Ruth resting, and that's what my dear wife's doing down in the cemetery this morning. Her soul and spirit is in heaven, but she's worked her, did her work on earth, and she's resting. And then, lastly, chapter 4 is rewarded. A lot of people, and let me tell you, if you're out there and you watch these prosperity preachers and they want you to send them a seed, don't do it. You better be up, you'd be better off burning it. But we are not promised any anything on earth. Some Christians can make money, and it's it's a blessing, and they need to use that money wisely. Some Christians poor as old goats turkey. Some Christians have cancer. Some Christians are healthy. We're the rain, the, the rain on the just and the unjust. What we are promised is once we get to heaven, in, in, 2, Timothy 5, in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it says we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is, which is the Bema seat where we get our reward. Now, Ruth 1, I want to say this. I think I said it's a theocracy. What you'll find in the Old Testament is the supernatural, it's commonplace. And also what you find with Israel is numbers, 47 numbers. What you find with the church is no numbers. We're in the, we're in the engagement period of the marriage between the bride, which is the church, and the bridegroom, which is Jesus Christ. We don't know how long it's going to last. It, in the Jewish wedding, it lasted about a year. But the engagement period for the church has already been over 2,000 years. Maybe another 2,000. We don't know. It looks like it's going to be pretty soon. It's going to be over. But another thing that is very important to remember, and when you study about Israel, it's an, it's, it's an agrarian society. All agriculture. They don't learn how to make money until they go into Babylon. When they go into Babylon, they learn how to bank, and they learn how to make money. And, and here it is an agricultural society, everything. And the laws pertain to the land, and the laws are for the people. Now, the kingsman redeemer, redeemer, I want to emphasize this. The kingsman redeemer is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be, to be a kingsman redeemer, you have to be kin. In other words, Jesus had to have flesh. You had to be able. You had to have the money to do it. You had to be willing. And you also had to have no outstanding debts, which Jesus had none. He, he was without sin. The book of Ruth, reveals the love side of Kingsman Redeemer. There's some in the, in the Israel society that redeemed for profit. Jesus didn't. It was strictly a love deal. Now we're going to study in detail Ruth 1.1. 1, 1, and we're going to study in detail the whole book. We're going to start in Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. Let's look at it. Uh, and I'm not there, so y'all wait. And I hope you helped your place. I didn't. But I've got it marked. Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. 
Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. What we'd say, house of food. Uh, you know, they put out a list of the ten most, uh, I guess you'd say, where people would live. And that's where Bethlehem was. Is a house of food, of bread. Judah means praise. So they left the house of bread and praise to go to Moab, which the Moab in, in Hebrew means uh, uh, wash pot. Uh, it means uh, it's it in Psalms. Uh, it means uh, Mo, uh, in Psalm one hundred eight nine. It says, Moab is my wash pot. Or we'd say Moab is our mop water. Uh, they were idolaters. They practiced child sacrifice. And I'm not going to say anything about abortion, but to me it's similar. Uh, idolaters. They practiced child sacrifice. Uh, Moab was Lot's descendant. Lot's son, by his uh, incestuous relation with his daughter, was Moab, and this is his descendant. Uh, God's, we see a, God, a picture of God's marvelous grace here with Moab. Uh, you know, Israel was in Egypt 400 years. And the uh, reason was Abraham was told by God in Genesis 15, 16, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full or complete. In other words, and I think this for our country today, I really do. God gave the Amorites 400 years to clean up their act. There's a cup that God was waiting to be full, and the Amorites never did repent. And it was the same way with Moab. And what would happen, and when that cup's full, God's judgment comes. In Ruth 1 1, it says a famine. There's 13 famines in the Bible, they're remedial judgments. Some people believe what we're going through now is remedial judgment. Uh, remember the word for correction over in 2 Timothy 3.16. I'll say this about what's going on right now. For a lot of seniors, this social distancing isn't anything new. And for people to be without is not anything new. A lot of it is new to us. But if you were here during World War II, uh, seeing empty shelves is nothing new. Let's read verse 2. In Ruth 1 verse 2. And the name of the man was Emelech, and I'm going to mispronounce the boy's name. And the name of the wife was Naomi. And the name of the two sons were Malon and Selion, and the Ephrath of Bethlehem. And they came in the country of Moab, and here's really important, the last two words, and they continued there. Now, Emelech, let me say this. In the Hebrew, names meant something. I used to work in a lab in Fort Oliver, Texas, and we, we had names. Some of them I'm not going to mention, but there was one guy named Fat Boy, and another boy, man, they called Boxing, and then, of course, there's another one they called Lefty or whatever. These names were descriptive, and they weren't very flattering. Well, it's about the same way with Hebrew names. Emelech means God is my king, so you'd figure he had a testimony. He was a man of faith. Naomi is an interesting name. Naomi is, in the Hebrew, means pleasant. Uh, Brother J. Vernon McGee calls her Mary Sunshine. But you would figure she had the fruit of the Spirit. Let me say this. I've been going to churches. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be negative. But I've been going to churches since I was 15 years old, and I'm 85. So that's 70 years. And there's people in church that I've seen in church, and I do judge, I'm sorry, that have no fruit of the Spirit. Or they don't, they don't, they don't project any fruit of the Spirit. But when I look at Naomi and, and the way she reacts and her character, the fruit of the Spirit are these. I should memorize them, but I'm not very good at memorizing. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And and Naomi displayed every one of them. 
Now, Malon, Malon, who is uh, their oldest boy, name means unhealthy. This young man, not a head cancer, he had a heart problem, maybe he had diabetes, but you know they didn't have the medical, uh, I don't think they went to Moab because of a better health facility. But anyway, the boy of Sion, the youngest boy, now in different translation, his name means different things, and here's what I get out of it. One translation says his name means failing. That would be failing health. Another one says puny. He was weak. Uh, don't know. Schofield says panning, P-I-N-I-N-G. Well, panning means to waste away because of grief. So this kid might have had despondency. Uh, you know, he might have uh, been, uh, what do you call it? What did Abraham Lincoln have? He, Depressed. Abraham Lincoln suffered from being despondent. There's another word for it. I can't think about it. But anyway, that could have been his problem. We don't know. There's a lot we don't know, but God tells us what we need to know. We do know that they had great parents. They, they, no matter what, they had great parents. Because if you can have joy and faith, and you have the burden of unhealthy children, then you've got a lot of character if you've got joy and faith. My, my wife always said joy was Jesus, others, and you. Now, uh, I've got 10 minutes, Holly said. That's good. That's a lot more than I thought I'd have. Ephrathites, I can't pronounce it, of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, this is important uh, because this really meant, this little word that I can't pronounce meant a region. To me, it would be like, we live in New Harmony. New Harmony is Tyler address. It's in there, that zip code. We're in the same region as Tyler. So when you talk about New Harmony, you say we're Tyler. And to me, that's about what this is. But what I, important about it is uh, that in prophecy, it says that uh, Jesus would be born in this place, in Beth, which is Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2 is the verse I'm talking about. And concerning the Messiah, it says he is coming from Bethlehem, Ephraim. And then over in Genesis 30, uh, 5, 19, it says this place is Bethlehem. So it's the same place. It'd be like Highland Park is to Dallas in my way of thinking. Now it says continued there. That means they made their home there. You'd, you'd often think, and you'd often think, or I would think about Lot and Lot in Sodom. You know, Abraham and Lot came to a place. And there's always this people this way. Lot look for the greenest grass and what would look good to him. He wasn't led by the Lord. And he wound up in Sodom and Gomorrah. And what, what eventually happened is God sent two angels in there to get Lot out. And it's a picture to me of the church because God will not bring tribulation upon this world, on this earth, until he gets the church out of it. Amen. It's the same way with, the, with Noah and the ark. God would not bring judgment until Noah and his eight people of his family were in that ark. So, and I think about Lot. But you know, if you go over into 2 Peter, I've got it down here somewhere. 2 Peter verse 7 of chapter 2, it says Lot was just. Lot was just. It says just Lot. You know what that means? That means you will see Lot in heaven. If you know Jesus Christ, you will see Lot in heaven. So what does that mean? It means that these people, and, and they were what we would call backslidden. Because when you were out of Canaan, you were out of God's will if you were Israel. Israel in Canaan was in God's will. Israel out of Canaan was out of God's will. Some people think, and there's songs about Canaan being heaven. It's not heaven. Canaan is not a picture of heaven. Canaan is a picture of you being in God's will. And let me tell you this. Being in God's will is not bad. It won't hurt you. All it means is that you talk to God on a daily basis, that you're in a mood of prayer, and that, that you speak to him. It, he's not going to call you to China or somewhere. He, he, uh, he prepares you for anything he gives you to do. But it's not about doing. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So they continued there. Now God is my king as head of the house at the Amalek must take responsibility for taking his family from the house of bread and praise to eat 
out of that garbage can, which was Moab, which sacrificed their children to a god, small g-o-d-s, uh, for whatever reason. Now, it's kind of remind me of the verse in the Bible where, in Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph said, God meant it for good. There is no way that I think Emelech took his family out of, out of Bethlehem to hurt his family. He was looking. He evidently, he had let all his property foreclose. Remember, the Jews were given this land, and this land was never to leave their family. They had laws to protect, so they would, that land would never protect their family. But it's just like we are. Some of them could handle money, some of them couldn't. And some of them foreclosed five minutes. Some of them had their property foreclosed on, and it had to be redeemed. It had to be bought back. So he, he left, and when he left, he left with his land foreclosed, and he left with two sick boys. But I do not think he left uh, because of, of anything else, except he was looking for food, and he was in bad financial straits. The main thing is I want to tell you right here is the scarlet thread of redemption from Genesis 3.15 to Galatians 4.4 4 is not broken. It's still intact. And even though God made these people free will, they made decisions. God still worked in their life to bring about what he wanted. Let's look at verses 3 through 4. I was hoping to get to 7, verse 7, but we'll get there. Verse 3. And Emelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Oprah, and the name of the other, Ruth. Oh, I love that name. And they dwell there about 10 years. They dwell in that land 10 years after, after they married. Now, in the Bible, it talks about far country. And far country means out of God's will. And this is what this is a picture of. Uh, it says they took wives of Moab. This broke the Mosaic law. And the way this works is very hard because, you know, we live in the age of grace and we take so much for granted. We can go to God and speak to him anytime we want to through Jesus Christ and we ignore him. We ignore what he does. It's, it's just really. But these people, they had the Leviticus system and they had to meet certain requirements to worship. And one of them was, if, they, if these boys married these Moabites for 10 generations, they could not worship. They could not. And that was the law. And they broke the law. So when you get out, I do not think going to church is entirely that, but I think fellowship is, and I think we need to go to church because I don't know too many people that study the Bible at home. But we need to stay close. We need to stay close to the Lord. It's so easy to get out of fellowship with the Lord. We're in, we're in the grace age. And what it tells us, we don't have a law where, where we're, we can't worship for 10 years, but we do have a law, and I'm talking to believers, and I write this on my granddaughters and grandsons, every card I give them, I believe, and it's 2 Corinthians six fourteen, and this is what it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We're not to do it, but we do it. Oprah, going on, Oprah means dear or fond. That would mean that she's athletic. And she married this boy who was puny. Now, op, they say opposite are drawn. I guess that's what happened. Ruth, and I love this, means beauty, beauty, personality. Hollywood ruined this word. They don't even know what it really means. But what you'd say is glamorous. She was glamorous. Uh, over in uh, Genesis 29, 17, it says, Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And this is what you could say about Ruth. And as we go along, we'll see this. And she married the oldest boy, Malon. Now, uh, in his humanity, this is what's important about this. And I guess, I, how much time I got? One minute. Huh? Just about. Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes? Yeah. I don't mind talking. I mean, two minutes. Yeah. But I, I want this. I, this is very, I'm saying this a lot, but this is important. This is why we study the Bible. And we need to know this. Remember, what happens is Ruth is going to be the great-grandmother 
of King David. And when you get over in Luke and Matthew, you're going to see that King David is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So Ruth's blood is going to be in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Boaz, who's a Jew, Ruth's a Gentile, Boaz is a Jew. So you're going to have Gentile and Jew blood in our Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means he's all. He represents all of us. If he was just Jew, it would be different. Or if he was just Gentile, but he wasn't. That's he right. has the blood of both in his humanity. That's right. And that's important. Now, Ruth 5 through 6, this is where I wanted to, to get. I don't have time. With through? You got me. You got me. <laughs> Tell Are them, they still there? Uh, yeah. yeah, tell Donna Green thank you. She's been giving some really good comments. We love you, Donna Green, and um, well, we can't. I, but just, just wrap it up, Daddy. Well, I'm through. Okay. Well, what do you want to tell them? Nothing. Okay. See you next week. Well, I, I will say I wanted to get to Ruth uh, five and six, and we and it's really would be for someone out of church, and we use that word. There's backslidden people in church, plenty of them. Well, we use that as a, and we shouldn't, as a reference to people that aren't having a relationship with the Lord Jesus. That's what's important is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you talk to him regularly, that's, that's important. We'll go from there. And, and these verses are about that. Matter of fact, it reminds me of the song, uh, Coming Home. And the next thing is, what's important about these, is people that do not know Jesus Christ, the first thing you have to realize is your loss. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's right. All of us have. Everybody. It don't matter who you are. And the only way to get in contact with God is through Jesus Christ. And you have to accept the fact that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sin, that he was buried. He was dead now. He was buried and he was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he lives today making an intercession for you in heaven. And once you take that step, you know, when somebody is in church and they take that first step out of that pew and hit that aisle, they're saved. Because they've made the decision to accept Christ as their Savior. When you walk, it's good to walk down there and make a public profession. It's good to kneel at the cross and confess your sin. But when you make that decision, God knows your heart, you're saved. And that's it. And we'll see you next Sunday. Is that it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.